Hi, so in video 13.24 we unboxed this thing and in video 13.34 we set it up. Now we're actually going to look at the Chiterbox software. Now the Chiterbox isn't the actual design tool software, it's the slicing software. It's the software that changes your design file into a file that the printer can understand and print because it needs to create a series of images that it can shine the light through as this raises up curing the resin and creating your part. Now, the key to understanding the, the slicing software is also un to understand how this thing actually works. Now, that bed is the base plate that goes into this resin reservoir and it sits on the bottom. The light shines and then it pulls up a little bit and then goes back down, but not quite as far. It goes back down to 50 microns, getting ready for the next slice. But that resin is effectively a UV glue. So it glues onto this bed plate, and that's where it's gonna stick. But it also glues onto this FEP sheet. And there's a tub of war as that actually pulls up because you've got two glued surfaces. And what you want to happen is you want the bed plate to win, and you don't want this sheet to win otherwise you'll just pull the part off it'll stick to this and then every other slice will just be shining onto something that's already there so you won't get a part you'll just get a lump of cured resin stuck to your FEP sheet understanding that that you must win that tug of war is actually key to understanding how to draw the image that you want with its support and with its raft size so that this wins the tug of war anyway let's go and look at that software so in videos 1324 and 1334, we opened up and set up the Mars 2 Pro. Now then, the software that comes with it is this. It's Chiterbox, and I've got version 1.8.1, although they will update it on their website for any updates that have been brought out. Now, the software is slicing software, so in order to create your part, you need to have a different kind of software where you can draw it, or grab yourself some STL files from things like Thingiverse, something like that. But you need your part. Once you've got your part, you can drop it into the file list here, which will then present it actually on this image here, and that's the bed plate that you're going to be printing with. Now, Chiterbox is a slicing software, so it prepares your part for the actual process of being able to print it, and we've got a little bit of mucking about with it that we need to do. Now, when you drop this in, it drops straight onto the bed plate as if it were a filament printer. And filament printers and resin printers are slightly different in that resin printers don't like the large foot plate like this of your part straight on the bed plate because that bottom section here is exposed the longest and there's a tendency for it to be slightly larger than the actual uh, part that, that you've designed. But there are things you can do about that. I mean, one thing is just accept it when it's non-critical and carve it down to the size you want it or just leave it alone. The other thing is to muck around with it a little bit. Now, because this is an STL file, you can see that the part is actually bigger than the plate. So there's going to be some issues there at actually being able to get that to print. Now, in order to rotate that, what I'm doing is using the right mouse button. The left mouse button selects and moves it or changes the perspective if you're outside of it. The right mouse button helps you rotate it, and you do have these rotation buttons here at the top. Now, in order to put this part to the right size and right orientation on the plate, what we need to do is scale it. And if you're here, you've got move, rotate, scale, and mirror. If we scale that, then we can lock the scale ratio, or we can scale X, Y, and Z independently. I want to lock the scale ratio, so if I change that to 80%, it'll automatically scale it for me and lock that ratio. So now it fits nicely on the bed plate, and it's 80% of the original size. If I want to move it, then I can put it on the plate, I can center it, or I can just move it along the X, Y, Z coordinates. What I actually want to do is rotate it. If I rotate it, then I want to rotate it 60 degrees on the Y axis. And it lifts it off the plate for me, so that now it's at a 60 degree angle to the plate. Now obviously this is a circular thing, so I can rotate it if I like on the uh, Y axis. Put that back to zero, 
or I can rotate it on the x-axis. Or again on the z-axis. Anything that rotates that part from the bed plate so that it's an angle to the bed plate because of the way these resin printers work. In order to get them to print, I need to give it a raft and some support. So if I click on that one there, then you can see it's created this object for me at the bottom, which is the raft. That raft is a large area that prints onto the bed plate so that the rest of the part can have supports and be printed from it. And if I look there, you can see that that red mark there is indicating that the part will actually be printed beyond the bed plate. So that's not a good thing. We need to rotate that again so that we get that raft plate actually lined up on the bed plate. now we're lined up. Go back to the support section. Now when I was doing the research on this we got some advice. We got to remember that this thing actually is being printed that way around. So this section here is the bit that actually touches the film and gets exposed first and then as the exposure increases it goes down to print the rest of it. And we can look at that by sliding this slider to show us what the print routine would be. So as it prints, the raft grows, then the supports are put in, and then the part grows until the whole thing's printed and lifts out of the resin. But there's an issue here with the raft. We look at that raft a little closer, you can see that it's actually got a cup-like formation. There's a lip here. If this has any flexibility at all, as it prints, this little cup will fill with fluid. And because we've got a lip here that's slightly flexible, it effectively makes a sink plunger. And this will stick to the FEP sheet and will pull the raft away from the bed plate and you'll get a failed print. And apparently this is one of the main reasons why printing fails for folk and you're just left, up with, left with a raft at the bottom and no part. So what you need to do is change that. So if we click on that, we can actually have a look at the raft, and we've got a difference on uh, raft shape, and here we can see the raft shapes, and we're using what's called the skate. We have a raft area ratio here, which is 110%. Because that raft actually forms the main point of attachment to the bed plate, and pulls against the FEP sheet as it prints, you want that relatively large. I'm going to leave it at that. Now you notice that the raft thickness is one millimeter and the raft height is 1.8 millimeters. That's what changes the cup. So if we change that to two millimeters and two millimeters, and there's a little quirk here, we have to go back to there and then back to there, you see the raft has been redesigned now so that there is no cup and this is one of the things that helps it print more successfully. Another thing is you can see that angle there. That angle has been set at a raft slope of 30 degrees. My research tells me that 75 degrees is quite a good raft slope to have. I go that and that and it will change it. So now basically we've got a raft, this is a great big slab with a tiny overhang we can get something under to price it off and that forms a good basis for later on when we want to actually print this thing. Okay so having built the raft what we need to do now is add support to it so that the thing can actually print and you'll notice this area here. If I were to click all, it would add supports that it thought based on these density values here. 
Now, this is the first time I've been using this, so I don't want to over-support it, and it is 100% that I'm over-supporting it. And if I put in 85%, click all, now it adds to the supports that it thinks I want. And if we have a look at that, we can see the kind of support values that it's got. That's quite a lot of support. Chances are it is over-supported, but <laughs> I'd rather have a successful print and sand them off than just have failure after failure. And when I was reading on this, this is what it suggested to do. So I quite liked it and thought that's what we'd do. Now, if we have a look at how that's actually printing, which we can do here by sliding that bar down, we can see where the supports are being printed and when the first part is actually being attached to the supports. And we've got this section down here with lots of support as it begins to print. Now, as it moves up in its print, We can see that it actually begins to progress to the left hand side of the screen. So it's going off in this direction. And there, there isn't actually that much support as it continues to grow up. So what we can do is add support. And if you see there, it just comes by itself and we can click it and add some extra support just to make sure that we get the thing to actually print. And if you want to answer the question, am I over supporting this, then that's 100% yes I am. But as I say, this is the first few times I've done this, I'd rather have success out of it than anything else. So I'm looking for that more than anything. And we can continue with that, just adding support until you feel that you've got enough support in there. Okay, so having done that, we're pretty much done. Now, obviously, this is just to get going with it. It's a first time print, and there's clearly plenty of things to play around with there. We go back here to the settings and print. Then we can have a look at the print settings. Now, these heights here are uh, the thickness that each print layer will do. So it's 50 microns. We've got a bottom layer count there of 8. I'm going to change that to 5. So it prints the first 5 layers. So this exposure time is the exposure time for the print. I've been told that 2.5 seconds is a good time. And this bottom exposure time is the exposure time that those first 5 layers get and those first lines, five layers get 50 seconds to make sure that they're good and cured. Now, the light off delay is the amount of time that the light is off, and that leaves it time for the resin to flow back in, because we're obviously lifting this up and down as we print it to pull each successive layer from the FEP sheet to allow the next layer to print. That light off allows for the resin to flow back in underneath the part that you've just pulled off. So the default is clearly zero, and we want to give that some time, and seven seconds is going to be lots of time. And we've got a bottom light off delay as well, and that is for the bottom few layers. Now this bottom lift distance is the height at which it actually pulls it off from the plate, and the lift distance default is five and five, which is fine. The bottom lift speed is the speed at which it pulls it. If you set that too high, it tries to yank it off, basically. And if you set it too low, then it actually peeled, has a much better chance to peel. And 60 to 65 seconds is just plenty of time for that. The retract speed is the speed at which it lifts up. We'll set that to 210. And that's it. Now, clearly, there are an awful lot of other bits and pieces that you can play around with, and you can change some of these to cure some of those other things that we were talking about, like uh, the larger size and extra exposure time that the bottom layers get. But this is something to play with later, and as I say, we're really just looking at getting this thing to make a print. So having set those settings, then we're pretty much ready to slice it. So you slice it.
and it generates this screen. Now, this area here shows what the exposure is like. So if we take that down, then these are the images that will be displayed by the monochrome screen as it prints. So it's going to display those images. The UV light will shine through those images and it will result in this print here. I think that's kind of cute, actually. And to get a print, that's basically all there is to it. So now we can save the file, stick it on a thumb drive, and we're ready to go. So that's it, and the file is on this thumb drive, which gets inserted in here, and we're actually ready to print. So in the next video, we will start that print running. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching, and please remember to like and subscribe.